Hello, Raylan here. I am super excited. Oh my goodness, I have another really amazing interview for you today. It's with Claudia Goodell. She has had her own incredible journey with uh, various chronic illness conditions, including uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or ME-CFS, fibromyalgia, chronic Lyme disease, and she is now fully recovered. So it's just so incredible to hear these stories. So thank you so much, Claudia, for taking the time to, to speak with me and be on my channel today. Oh gosh, thank you for allowing me to speak my story. Yeah, so why don't we or why don't you tell people where you are in the world? I am residing in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's very warm and lovely at this time of year. So we're here obviously to talk about your health journey. So can you take us back a bit? Tell us a bit about how what life was like before this all started and so forth. Yeah, so uh, my journey with illness began a, quite a long time ago, uh, in 1985. I was a single mom, newly divorced, and that was a lot of stress. I had little education, high school, and not a lot of work skills or experience, so I had monetary stress. And then I had a boyfriend, and from him I contracted a virus, uh, and I think, looking back, I feel like there were probably several viruses compounded in a year, uh, one year period of time, and I was only 25. So, you know, when you're 25, you feel like, yeah, I'm sick, but I'll be fine. Uh, and you get over it and you just keep pushing through life. And, and that was my MO. And then I met my current husband within a year. He was in college and he encouraged me to go to college. So I was at that point now 27, going to college, single mom, working part time. And he was very athletic and super active. And so we did all, all kinds of sports together. We traveled together and... You know, so we had this very busy life. I was super driven at that point. I really wanted to get my college degree, and then I ended up going on for a master's degree. So it was just push, 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 right? And all through that period of time, I was sick, and I was feeling, it was almost like a locomotive was coming slowly behind me. You know, I was just dragging and pushing and dragging, and I can even remember sitting in his driveway at the end of visiting with him and just feeling like on the inside, I am dying here. I have to go home. It's seven o'clock at night. I'm 26. I have to go home and put on my pajamas and lay on the couch because I feel horrible. And, you know, I just, I thought that binge sleeping was enough, that that's what I needed to do was just keep pushing and then binge sleep and I'll be fine. And so fast forward many years later, I was working as an audiologist for about a decade, which was not a good environment for me. There was a lot of sexual harassment, so that was more stress. So I decided to leave my career, went into pharmaceuticals, lots more stress. <laughs> it's like, how much stress can I endure, right? Um, and at that point I crashed. I just couldn't even make it through a shower in the morning. So I had to stop working. So that was 2005 and I still was undiagnosed. So from 1985 till 2005, I had one diagnosis at the time and that was Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so through the nudges from my work, I finally got diagnosed. And at that point it was chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia by a rheumatologist. And um, I was no longer able to work, so I was fully disabled. 2005, so I was 45. And I was an athlete, so I still continued to push, push, crash, push, crash, push, crash. I was surrounded by Ironmen, people who ran ultra marathons. My whole family, my husband was, is an endurance mountain biker. Um, so that mentality was just there all the time. So it was very difficult for me to surrender. So yeah, then I, other diagnoses added on. I ended up, I was building mountain bike trails in Dallas in the 90s and I got bit by a tick and didn't understand that they carried illness and went unchecked. And so in 2012, that chronic Lyme was added to my list. I had had endometriosis in the past and hysterectomy and yeah, just a lot of, a lot of things, right? So yeah, I think I might have missed some things in there, but that was the progression of it. It was a slow, slow onset and then boom, I just 
as the train hit me. Well, you did a really good job of summing that up because that was a really big question. <laughs> like, tell me about 30 years of your life in five minutes or less. Right? Yeah, that's, that is a lot. Yeah. Uh, it for, was a lot. I'm so sorry you've had to go through all of that. I, it sounds un, unimaginably hard. So when you did finally get some of these diagnoses, what were the doctors telling you in terms of treatment? Mm. So the rheumatologist who diagnosed me, I, I asked her before I left, so when do I come see you again? And she said, you don't need to come back. There's nothing I can do for you that you're not already doing for yourself, which was pr pretty much nothing. And uh, so I went home and you know, I'd worked in pharmaceuticals for a few years at that point, so I was very astute with the medical community, and that shocked me. I'd never in my life imagined that a person could become so ill that they couldn't even stand up in a shower, and the medical community would say, we can't help you. We have nothing for you. That just devastated me. So I went home, and I think... I searched, like a lot of us do, search, 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 right? And I would go to all these specialists, and each one had their own little narrow focus, and would say, do this, and I would do that, and sometimes it did nothing, and sometimes it made it worse. And then I would grow tired, I'd be so weary of it, the search, and, and not, really not making any progress, and sometimes feeling even more sick. So I would stop, and I would just stay home and do nothing. And then the urge would come again. Oh, I've got to search, search, search. So it was this cycle that just went on for years, um, years and years. What sorts of things did you try over the years, Claudia, that didn't help? I always find that a bit interesting. Mm. A lot of supplements. Oh, my gosh. I had boxes and boxes of supplements that everyone tried to give me for various symptoms. I don't even remember what they were at this point. So many of them. And, you know, I ended up with the bottles of them unfinished. Um, I did a lot of things that did help, um, acupuncture, Chinese medicine, herbs. There were some herbs that did not help, by the way. I would say a lot of supplementation were the things that did not work. I never did hardcore pain meds. I never did hardcore sleep meds. Uh, I don't tolerate chemicals well. So um, it was it was very low key for me what I ingested. Um, and, and I was very quick to learn whether it was not working or not. It didn't take long. When you got those uh, diagnoses of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, had you heard of these conditions before? I had, um, only because my primary doctor had sort of hinted that she thought I had chronic fatigue syndrome. I, at the time, did not understand the difference between chronic fatigue, the symptom, and chronic fatigue syndrome, the illness. Uh, fibromyalgia, I only thought was pain. I didn't understand all of the symptoms that are involved in fibromyalgia, nor did I feel like they were the same illness, which I do now. Yeah, so my knowledge level was, was pretty low at the time. And what were your thoughts about receiving those diagnoses? How did that feel? It was a huge relief at first. After searching for so many years, it felt like validation, right? I could at least tell people I have this, you know? So that part of it felt like a relief valve had opened. What didn't feel good was that at the same time of my diagnosis, my, my employer required me to apply for long-term disability, and that required me to file for social security disability, which I did not want. I, I fully expected I would get well in a year and go back to work, right? Um, but right after I got the diagnosis, I got the letter in the mail that I had been approved for Social Security disability. And I'll never forget that moment because we had friends over. We were socializing. And I thought it would be a denial, so I opened it in front of them. And it was it just devastated me. I think I probably had to sit down. I started to cry. It was just this overwhelming feeling that, uh, oh my God, I am so sick that I can't work. It just, it all kind of just caved in. Yeah. 
And what were your, the people close to you, like your family and friends, what was their reaction throughout this? My husband was always super supportive with, you know, the fact that I wasn't able to do what I had been able to do before. I think, as most healthy people, it's, it's pretty impossible for them to really grasp the depth of what it's like to lose everything. That was my struggle, I think, with my family was trying to explain that I felt like a shell, right? Everything has been sucked out of me. I serve no purpose in life. Um, you know, and our life was going to races, camping out at these races. And I couldn't do that. And um, I just, I felt like I'm being careful with my words because I don't want to make it sound like he was less supportive than he was, but there was this inability for him to understand that I needed him to step back to my place. And, and instead he moved forward in his space. So, you know, continuing to do life. And I didn't understand that. Um, and I said, that that's not what I expected. Uh, but he basically said, you know, if, if, if it were the other way around, I would expect you to keep living life. And now, on this side of it, I completely understand what that meant. But back then, I felt like I can't do this by myself. That's what it felt like. It felt like abandonment, I guess. It's so interesting to hear you explain that. And it resonates with, you know, so much that I've been through. You know, when I first became unwell, I logical or not, I kind of expected the world to stop turning. It felt so severe and devastating what was happening to me. It's like, how can everyone just be going on with their lives when I feel like I've been kidnapped or I'm a prisoner in my own body right now? Like, this needs to be priority one. But when these yeah. things go on for so long, and then of course I grew up with a mother who was unwell and I was on the other side of it. And I could see that from her and I have a lot of guilt around this even still to this day, but I felt like she was being very selfish. Like why, why, like I wasn't allowed to be happy. I wasn't allowed to live my life. You know, my right. father and I weren't allowed to go out and do things without her. And so I really struggled with that, you know, being younger. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you sharing that because it's, mm -hmm. I think it's helpful for people to, you know, to understand from, from all sides. It's a challenging And it's thing. a delicate topic, right? Yeah. Because you don't want to undermine the true support that you did receive. But, but I feel like it's worth explaining because it was my experience and it was a disappointment to me. It was a huge disappointment to me. I felt like mm -mm, marriage it shouldn't be that way. That shouldn't be how it is, but um, yeah. But part of, part of what I'll tell later in this interview, I think kind of ties in with this because it, his continuing on with life actually helped me. Well, I'm very excited to hear, you know, I know that there is a, a very happy ending to all this. Um, so, yeah, so eventually you did start to find some things that helped you to recover. So how did that happen? So um, let's see. So in 2012, when I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme, um, it just happened that a neurosurgeon who had treated Lyme patients in Manhattan moved to Albuquerque where I was living and so I began to see her and she treated me with an herbal protocol it's called the Byron White protocol and at first it was to clear out heavy metal heavy metals I had a large amount of heavy metals and I know that's a controversial topic um, and that the tests are not really normalized however I trusted that my levels were high because it also showed that I had very high levels of gadolinium, and that can only come from one source, and that was from contrast dye from an MRI that I had had two months, a month or two before the test. And when I had that, I asked the tech what the half-life of gadolinium was, and they told me, and I, it was either 24 or 48 hours, a very short, so within a week it should have been gone. And this was at least a month or two later, and it was still there, and it was really high. So I knew that my body was not purging out harmful heavy metals. I had lead, I had mercury, I had copper, calcium, um, gadolinium, and I don't remember the rest. Lead was terrible. <clears throat> so she was treating me for those. 
I thought it would take a year, so I was so committed, right? I thought, oh yeah, in a year I'll be done with this and I'll be better, and it took three. <laughs> and the scariest part of that was that some of the metals started to budge, but lead was not budging even a little bit. And I went to her one day after two years and she said to me, very bluntly, the only way that this is possible is if you're ingesting it on a daily basis. And I wasn't sure if she was trying to say someone was slowly poisoning me. <laughs> I had no idea what she was suggesting. But I went home and I really thought about it, like as a scientist would think about it. And I realized that the dishes and glasses, everything that I was using in my house for food, all had lead in them. They were all old. They were all cheap. And so I thought, well, you know what? It's a long shot, but I'm going to throw them all away and I'm going to start over with lead-free products. And I did. And within a month, all my lead levels were down. So <laughs> it was crazy. And when I told her, she said, this is unbelievable. I've never seen this happen before. So that was a learning experience. So that protocol was three years long. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Karnofsky scale um, tool. It's a measurement for symptoms, fatigue, symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. And I took it before her treatment and after. Um, it's just a questionnaire that you fill out. And before the treatments, I was at 40% functional level of my normal from before I was sick. Mm -hmm. After the treatments, I was at 60%. And it doesn't sound like a lot. 20% increase in functional level, but at that point, at that, that 40, 50, 60%, it's a huge, huge improvement. And, um, and that was fortunate because that's when my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So I was feeling stronger. I was feeling better and I could do a little bit more. And then my mom, she was 87 and it was stage four ovarian cancer. So I became her caregiver. I took care of her house, took care of her finances. My dad had a stroke. And so this went on for three years. <laughs> so yeah, it was so stressful. And then, you know, I, I did that. I was committed to do that. And then after they both passed, which was within a year of each other, that was 2016, 17, I was still doing advocacy at that time. So I had been basically managing running the Race to Solve CFS Facebook group for advocacy. And I had been on some working groups supporting the Solve MECFS. They used to be the CFIDS Association. And um, I was quite involved in that. But when my parents died, it kind of changed everything for me. I'm so sorry for the loss of both your parents. And quite recently, I, I can't imagine how difficult that must have been. Um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. How, how did you work through that process with your parents? Did your health maintain or did you have a drop off again? Surprisingly, I think it maintained pretty well. Uh, I'm not sure if, I mean, I, chronic Lyme was pretty bad. It, it was responsible for a lot of my symptoms, um, brain fog for sure. So I think, I think that I was at a level where I could maintain helping them and do nothing else. <laughs> so that was it, right? I, I did my thing with them and then I would go home and sleep. And and I knew it was temporary. And, and frankly, spending that time with my parents was somehow good for me on a, on a soul level. I learned about my parents as people. I learned about myself as a person and why I was who I was, which fed into my recovery the dynamics in our family were very apparent when I was spending that much time with them. And uh, there was just this rewarding feeling, I think, helping someone through death. It's quite rewarding. Um, so yeah, some positives came of that too. With your chronic, chronic Lyme disease diagnosis, I'm curious, because uh, I was diagnosed with that as well, so I know that they put me on you know, long doses, heavy doses of antibiotics. Did you go through that sort of treatment protocol, or what, what did that look like for you? I, I didn't. In fact, that was recommended right before that neurosurgeon moved to Albuquerque. I was ready to go to Denver. That's where they told me to go. 
and I just, you know, you have this gut feeling about something and it just didn't feel right. I just kept telling my husband, I really don't want to do this. I just don't feel like I should do this. Partly that was because I have what's called primary immune, immune deficiency also. My sister and I both have it. Probably my brother does as well. We don't, our bodies don't make enough immunoglobulin. So our immune systems don't function as well as they should, which probably helped me get sick in the first place. I didn't want to do a lot of antibiotics because I didn't want my immune system to be further damaged by doing that. So that was part of my decision. The, the herbal treatment was super small, like microdosing of these herbs. And she would have to scale those back even because you know how sensitive we are when we're sick with these illnesses. I couldn't tolerate even these tiny little, if it was powder, it was like a 16th of a teaspoon every other day. And it was too much. So a lot of it was us trying to figure out what's what's going to work and what's not going to work. And um, yeah, it, it really, I could feel the changes happening in me though. I could feel my cognition starting to improve. And, um, my digestion improve. I still had so far to go, but at that time I didn't, I didn't know that, which I think is, is a blessing. <laughs> I think that's really incredible though, that you had that, that sense of, of knowing yourself and knowing your body and you not just blindly following whatever someone told you to do, you know, because when I had my diagnosis, I was very much in that state of my doctor was my boss and I did whatever he said and everything they put me on, I was so, I got so much worse. I was throwing up, I could barely lift my head. It was intense and he was like, he's like, oh, if you lived closer, I would have you on, on IV antibiotics and all this other stuff, but he was, anyways, I just, yeah, I think it's oh. interesting to have these conversations or important to have them, you know, for people that are facing these. So you, you have it, different perspectives of what it can yeah. look like. And I'm not even convinced to this day that I ever had chronic Lyme disease because apparently the testing I got done was um, controversial, so I, I don't even know that I ever had it, so I don't know the kind of damage that all that did to the my body. Whole illness is so controversial, yeah. really. And you know, I think you just reminded me that prior to doing that treatment, I had gone to see a doctor of Chinese medicine, and she thought it would be a great idea to do some IV treatments. They were cocktails. I think it was high dose vitamin C and. Um, Cyanocobalamin, is that how you say it? Um, Cyanocobalamin, I think is the right term. Anyway, I would sit there in this chair and get these treatments that were supposed to be six, and I was vomiting, I was passing out, I was so sick. And I remember after, I think it was the third one I got through, she lived five minutes from my house. I was driving home and I had to pull over because I was so sick, I couldn't even get home. And she just kept pushing. No, 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 you really have to get through these six treatments and you'll be better, I'm telling you. And I said, no, <laughs> this is not working for me. These other people were sitting next to me. They were mostly cancer patients. They were great. They were feeling bad, you know, fantastic on the treatments. It was not good for me. So I think, I, I think that experience taught me to listen to myself, my own body, and not to this person who's standing in front of me telling me what's best. I think that's such an important discussion and I'm so glad we're having it. And so many people I talk to tell me similar things, but that quite a few of us, it takes us a long time to get there. And I don't know if you had this experience, but I would hear a lot about, you know, one time when I was partially recovered, I went to this um, detox center, like health center, and they just did all sorts of stuff and I just got so ill. But I had been always hearing and reading that it was the Herxheimer reaction or it's your die-off yeah. reaction. The sicker you feel, the more healing the that is happening. Is. So it's so confusing yeah. when you're trying to heal. You're like, right. I'm trying something and now I feel worse. Is it because it's bad for me or because, wow, I'm finally going to be healed? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's confusing. It is confusing. But the neurosurgeon who I saw for chronic Lyme, she said, no, no. You should never, ever take so much that it makes you feel ill. Um, and so she was super willing to just back off and do it smaller. Smaller and slower was her method. And it took a lot longer, but she was right. So what happened from there? How did things progress with your recovery? So after the passing of my parents, I felt 
catalyzed to recover. I felt my own mortality coming. I was in my late 50s at that point, and I realized I cannot do this forever. This is not what I want. I was still doing advocacy, and I had this very, very strong urge to choose. Choose which one of these lives you would prefer to be in. The sick life, where you're talking to sick people all the time and advocating for sick people and yourself all the time, with very little hope that anything is ever going to make this go away, or do you want to associate with the healthy people in your life and just accept your limitations, whatever they are? And so I actually really sat down and had to make that decision. And I decided that it was very important for me to leave the advocacy world. And it was very difficult because I had started this group from scratch. I had built it out of a fundraising mountain bike race. I had done this. And so it was like it was my baby. And I felt like it offered a place for people to go to learn and to support one another and I didn't want that to be lost so fortunately for me I was able to find people who stepped up in a big way to take over and I trusted them 100% so I, I gave it up I, I stopped doing that and I cut ties with every person except for probably five people who had chronic illness of any kind completely just shut it down it was the best thing I ever did best 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 decision I could have possibly made without the constant reminder on a daily basis that I was a sick person I didn't think about it as much I didn't identify myself that way as much and that was the very first baby step to recovery even though that was not my goal at the time so much to unpack there I <laughs> Yeah. That is a lot. That is a, a really big shift. And interestingly, I mean, this is all just anecdotal, but something that I hear from a lot of people as well. That you know, It sounds like a big part of that final leg of your recovery was mind, around mindset and around um, thought processes and so forth. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. I, I always felt split in half while I was sick. I always felt like um, what is it, imposter syndrome? I'm pretending to be semi-healthy right now because I'm with the healthy people in my life. And now I'm pretending to be a sick person because I'm in this world with the sick people. And, and that pretending isn't the right word because I was both, right? Part of me was a little bit of both. But I couldn't function that way anymore. I had to just shut one down and, and just be whatever I was going to be within that world. And I felt like the healthy world was the better choice. And was making these changes, these massive shifts in your life, was that what was needed to get you fully past this? Or was there more that came with that? There was a lot more. So right before I made that decision, Dan Neufer, um, Neifer, I don't know how he says his name, with the ANS Rewire program, contacted me through that Facebook group asking permission to for me to post his book on there his cfs unraveled book had just come out in hardcover and um the page the group that i managed was very evidence-based and the people that i worked with on the working groups to the cdc they were all very evidence-based scientist people and so nothing got posted on there that wasn't read and passed the muster right so i said to him i have to read it first i can't just share this so that day, I went to his website and I read his free short book, Discover Hope. I read it in an hour. It was a very quick read. It was, it was the first time I felt hopeful about the possibility of recovery or that it even existed. I had never heard of anyone really recovering. I had heard about probably a handful of people who spontaneously improved, but not 100%. So this was very intriguing to me. Um, so I did that and then I watched a few videos, recovery videos, and that floored me. I thought, oh my god, these people look like real people and honest people and they really recovered? What? <laughs> you know, it was shocking. And so 
I ordered the book CFS Unraveled from Amazon and I downloaded it on Kindle. Mind you, this is all in like a half a day at this point. I sat down and read as much as I could from the Kindle and then the book arrived from Amazon and I read the book and I, part of it said, find a natural path that you can work with. Well, I bizarrely found a natural path right in my neighborhood right at that point. It just, it was like the universe was just rolling out this red carpet for me. Like all these things are right here coming up for you. You better be paying attention. And so um, I went to him and I told him, this thing sounds like something I might be able to do. Would you be willing to help me? And he not only said yes, but he ordered the book and read the book and talked to Dan. So at that point I knew this guy is the best person I've ever had as a provider. I will stick with him no matter what. And um, I told my husband, I think I need to do this because I had never resonated with anything like I did with that program, with the, the premise that the autonomic nervous system was dysfunctional made so much sense to me. And I felt strongly that if the autonomic nervous system had gotten skewed because of stress, stress being illness, stress being life, all these physical injuries that I had had, all those kinds of physiological stressors, if that occurred and caused me to become sick, then I can undo all of that just as well and become well. It just made perfect sense to me. So I told my husband and and I did it. I signed up for this program thinking perhaps I'll get some improvement, right? I was super resistant. I was very skeptical. I didn't want to tell a lot of people in the beginning. I told just a handful of people because I felt like I needed some, somebody needed to know. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, that's when I really was focusing on recovery, I guess, lightly stated. Yeah. I, it's, I actually just interviewed Dan again. He's been on the channel twice now. So I had him a while back and we did a really intensive uh, interview where he covered just all sorts of stuff, just a wealth of information. And people were just so appreciative of it. And I had so many people contact me saying that they started his program as a result of seeing that video wow. and are seeing tremendous progress. Of course, I'm not saying oh, wow. that this will work for everybody. I don't know that. Right. I, I just put the stuff out there for people to um, yeah. assess and see what's right for them. But yeah, so uh, yeah. I just had him on again, uh, another deep dive into the autonomic nervous system. I'll link it above here somewhere on the screen okay. if people haven't seen it. But yeah, I, I think he's incredible. So you've had a lot of success with that program as well, it sounds like. Yeah, and so leading up to that, I had already been doing some yoga. I was very limited in physically what I could manage. So we live close to a YMCA. So I was doing Tai Chi with the 85 year old people once a week and I barely could make it through. I was doing some at home yoga once in a while and it was very short, 15 minutes if, if that, mostly on the floor. I would really push myself and ride my mountain bike and then be sick for a very long time. And socially, you know, I, I could socialize maybe once a week. I couldn't go grocery shopping by myself. Doctor's visits were frequent and exhausting. So I had a pretty limited life leading up to that. I was also meditating already, not, not long sessions. I was meditating probably 10 minutes at a time, probably three times a week. I was listening to podcasts about the law of attraction and manifesting your desires. And so my mindset was completely changing. I was learning things. What else was I doing? I had been, if we get into food discussion, I was gluten-free, dairy-free for many years because I, my digestion was a wreck. And my husband and I had started doing plant-based probably a couple of years before I started doing dance program. I was a very healthy eater most of the time, most of my life. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, tolerate, I couldn't tolerate alcohol, so that was out of the question anyway. So I think Going into the recovery program, I was already practicing a good number of things that were in it. I didn't depend on stimulants. My sleep hygiene was 
really good, but my sleep was terrible. I had zero deep sleep. Um, I always woke up feeling like I hadn't slept at all. So yeah, so going into the program, I felt like, yeah, I'm already doing a lot of these things, but I will do them a little bit better. I will, I will become more focused and more determined and more dedicated to doing them the way that I should do them. Um, so meditation was key for me in the beginning of my recovery. And I tell people this all the time now, people who I coach, if your autonomic nervous system is ramped up, the best thing you can do is sit quietly. Just allow yourself to sit quietly and, and rest your brain. Um, yeah, so I, I did 45 minute sessions every morning out in the sun. I wanted to get my circadian rhythms back on track. So I felt like that was a very important thing for me to do. And I treated my recovery. This was key too. I, I pretended that I was in a recovery institution. I went into it with that mindset. I am in this facility and everything I do will be with the goal of recovery. So every decision I make, every activity I do, Every action step I take is for that purpose. Um, and, and that was my mindset through my recovery. And when you say I'm in this institution, you say you mean in your home, correct? Because ANS Rewire mm -hmm. is an online yeah. program, just to clarify if yeah. people are, okay. I was in my own home <clears throat> and no one was here making me do it. It was just me, uh, but I treated it that way. What, what would I be doing right now if I had a horrible cancer and I was in some kind of facility and they were trying to help me recover what kinds of things would they be having me do and that's what I did and through doing all of this uh, in combination with the ANS rewire this is what eventually got you back to fully healthy mm -hmm. yeah and it was super fast it was so fast and that is not normal I have to say that for most people it can take a year or two and for me, it was three months. It was so fast and so unexpected. I never expected to recover, really. Honestly, I was so extremely skeptical going into it. And then I started noticing little things changing. Um, I remember noticing that I woke up three days in a row feeling refreshed. And I told my husband, this could totally be a one-off, but that was three days in a row that I woke up feeling like I actually slept and I feel like I have energy. So that was the first thing I noticed. Then I started noticing I can carry on conversations now without stammering and stuttering and word searching and I'm remembering things better. And um, then I think, so that was those two things occurred. I started eating things that I hadn't eaten in years and it was fine. <laughs> and so, um, you know, every time you have a little success, it just, it, it motivates you to do more and, and your body responds, right? You have good chemicals and fuzzy things happen and it feels so good. Um, so every little success built on another success and that's not to say it was easy because it was not, it was super challenging. Um, partway through the program, I realized that I, after 30, what, 32 years, I think I was sick. I had created all of these coping mechanisms, thoughts, behaviors to protect myself from symptoms and illness and crashes and all those terms. And I wasn't even aware that I was having them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was having them in my sleep. Um, I'd wake up feeling like, oh gosh, you know, someone invited me to a party next week. I can't go to a party. <laughs> you know, I, then I would be having these thoughts during the middle of the night. So what I started doing was asking my husband, do you ever ha have a thought like this? And I would tell him the thought and he would just look at me like, what kind of space alien are you? <laughs> you know, what? No, of course I don't have thoughts like that. Um, and so I started realizing oh my gosh, my brain has just hijacked me for decades, decades. I have been protecting myself 
And so I dealt with that and there are ways to deal with that. I won't get into it, but um, there are methods for dealing with those. And, and I still do it to this day. If unhealthy thoughts come, I still deal with them now. I recognize them and I, I change them. Um, but it was a very important step in re my recovery. And, and in the beginning, it's, it's extremely challenging because you're kind of having to almost lie to yourself that, you know, so I thought, here's an example. A thought might come, my daughter wants me to go shopping with her tomorrow. So I tell her, yes, we'll go shopping with you tomorrow. She's known that I've been sick for many years, but still she's not sick. So she doesn't fully understand how I feel when I'm shopping, right? She might see the after effects, but she doesn't know how I feel when I'm there. So then I start having the thoughts, oh my God, I have to take a shower. I have to put on makeup. I have to do my hair. I have to get dressed. I don't even want to put on clothes. This feels horrible. Um, I have to leave the house. I have to drive. Oh my gosh, I have to drive. Driving is exhausting. And I don't even think straight when I'm driving half the time. And then I have to stop. I have to stand in the store and stand in line and the lights and the, I'm going to get a migraine and you know, all these thoughts were coming and I can't disappoint her. There's all this guilt. And so, yeah, dealing with that in the beginning looks like, okay, I can go shopping. I can take a shower. And then there's another thought right behind that. No, you can't. You're going to get sick. Right? So in the beginning, it's this, it's this strange thing that you're doing with yourself. You become this observer. You try to change the thought and then you fight yourself. So what I did was just say, healthy people go shopping every day. I can go shopping. I'll just go shopping for 20 minutes instead of an hour and a half. And then I'll rest for the next day. It'll be fine. I will be fine. So it was, it was a slight change in thought. It wasn't a full blown change in thought. And so gradually I worked my way to a point where I could go do something and there were no symptoms. It was just, it takes a very long time to rebuild roads in your brain. I always think about the Roman chariots, you know, the, in, in, in Italy, if you go there, you see the, the stone roads and you can see the marks where the chariots had gone. They're worn, right? You see the worn lines in the stone. And I, I think the brain connections are like that, that when you're chronically ill, you form these grooved lines in your brain and they're there for so long and they're so deep. And when you try to make changes, whether it's changes in movement, changes in posture, changes in smiling, changes in thoughts, all these different things that you're trying to do, you're forming a new group. You're taking the chariot a different way. And in the beginning, you're going over all the rocks and it's very bumpy and it's very difficult and it doesn't seem possible. But if you keep doing it, you eventually create a new path. And that's what I was doing. That is such a great explanation. And I, I'm sure it's something that a lot of people will, it will resonate. It's just, it's so interesting to hear about those layers of stress of what it's like to be unwell and then how many of those thought processes are just on autopilot and so cemented in. And I love that visual. Yeah. And I found it even with my own recovery, even once I was better, those thoughts were still there. When I'd look at my schedule for the next day and my brain would automatically dissect the 27 yeah. different steps for me to go through it and I would start to panic. Yeah. Even though yeah. I knew I could do it now and I was healthy, but it took Great. a long quite a long time and it was actually through yeah. the gift of a lot of these interviews where I learned a lot of things from people like yourself and I started doing things just like that I started picturing a track in my brain like my brain was going down this path of like do lots of stuff be sick your yeah. life is over and I would just picture building a new track in my brain yeah. sleep well yeah. eat well have energy and just every day yeah. picturing that new path and it's amazing but it's it nothing is. scientific here, but it's just, or maybe there is, I don't understand it, but it is. it's just, yeah. um, it's, it's incredible how powerful that can be. And actually I did want to say, it sounds psychological, right? It sounds like we're saying, mm -hmm. if you think yourself well, you'll become well, but it's not, it is, it is the neuroplasticity of the brain. It is the power of the brain 
to to create new pathways, new neural connections. And so this is science, mm -hmm. right? And and that was something else that I was learning. I have a degree in psychology, and back when I got my degree in psychology, they taught us that neural pathways were neural pathways. You're born with your neurons, you die with your neurons, you can't change this. Now we know better. We know the brain is plastic. And if you train yourself, you can make changes in your brain, physical changes in the brain. So those things that I learned helped me in my recovery too. I, this, knowing that this is scientifically possible helped me. So at this point, when you finally recovered, how long had you been living with some degree of chronic illness? I, I think, if my math is right, I think it was 33 years by the time I recovered. It was 32 or 33, so a, a long time. So yeah. what did it feel like to be recovered? Yeah. It was unbelievable given that it only took three months for my body to recover, my brain was lagging behind. It did not understand what was happening at all. Um, in fact, I remember having a conversation with Dan at the end and saying, I think I'm 80% recovered. And he started asking me questions. Well, what, what are you doing? You know, what can you do? What are you doing every day? And as I was answering them, I thought, what, what is happening here, right? I was just realizing what was happening to me. And he said, Claudia, I, th I think you're 100%. And I said, oh my God, I think you're right. And I just started to cry because I just, I couldn't even fathom it at that point. It was, it was just so fast, just so fast. So fortunately, my husband and I had planned a trip that took place right at that point. So I was able to remove myself from my normal environment after I finished the recovery program. And we went to Glacier National Park and I hiked and hiked and hiked and hiked so much. And days after day after day, right? Just hiking and biking. And it was just like, God, are you kidding me? This is real. And I think it took me a year at least to figure out that this, this is real and this is sticking. <laughs> and then, after the first year, I thought I was at 100%. The second year happened, and I thought, wait, I'm better than I was the first year after I recovered. So what am I now, 120% better? <laughs> and then this, I just finished my third year, and I was even better. So it keeps progressively getting better. Um, and, and I know there are people out there who feel like mm -mm, you're not they won't even say the word recovered they'll say remission mm -hmm. just as I knew I had MECFS I know I'm recovered I I just know I can tell so yeah it's bizarre yeah I, I did a video <laughs> about this recently and I was a bit nervous putting it up it's just talking about how I know I'm recovered and it's just my own experience and I, I it's just my own belief but very much saying a, a lot of what you're saying it's just yeah, it, it's just uh, it's such a different place. I've learned so much more about my body. I don't feel like I'm going to be struck down and instantly be sick again. Of course, no one can predict that, but it's right. It's right. It's wonderful to hear. The another yeah. another amazing thing about this story, about your story, it, of course, it's heartbreaking that you had to face this for so long. But I get a lot of people contacting me a lot who say, "I'm in my 50s. I'm in my 60s. I'm in my 70s." I don't hear stories yeah. of people recovering, people who've been sick for yeah. decades. I think it's too late for me. Do you know anyone who's recovered at this age? And the yeah. unfortunate thing, I think it's really important to share recovery stories like this, but with channels like mine, I'm restricted to a pool of people who are publicly sharing their stories, typically on Instagram. So this gives you a very specific oh. demographic. So it's giving yeah. a very specific picture of what recovery looks like. Like you have to be probably female, younger, Yep. maybe not sick that long but there are many people yep. like yourself who have been sick for a very long time and have fully recovered so I'm very grateful yeah I I thought that as well going when I was starting to investigate the program that was my thought too was that oh no I'm too old first of all and I've been sick far too long for this to ever be a recovery story um, but then I watched a recovery story of a woman who was about the same age. She may have been older, and she was sick for a few decades too. 
And that was my encouragement. Had I not seen that video, I don't know if I would have done it. So it made a difference to me to know that someone else was out there who had Absolutely. We want to see that, you know, it's possible for us. And if people who are recovering don't, if we don't see ourselves in them at all, it, it can make it feel even yeah. more impossible. And thankfully, right. more and more people have been reaching out to me or I've found them and I've interviewed them. So again, for people watching, if you are in this boat, I'll link up on the screen here. I have a whole playlist now of people who have recovered after decades of illness, recovered, fully recovered later in life. So it, it definitely, it definitely is happening. Wow. And then, you know, there's a lot of fear there were, for myself. There was a lot of fear involved in the idea of recovery. Um, we refer to secondary gains of being ill. And I know that's hurtful to some people, but honestly, I had secondary gains to being ill, right? There were no expectations of me anymore, right? I, I didn't have to work because I was too sick. So there was this great fear within me that not that I'm going to fail to recover, but that I'm going to succeed to recover. And then what am I supposed to do? Who am I anymore? I don't even know who I am. Everything that I felt represented me had been stripped away. Um, I'm not an audiologist. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm nothing now. And so I had to have a moment with myself where I sat down and thought, you know, if all these other things are gone. What else is there inside of me? that's still me what was there before that's still there and I thought way back way back to when I was very young I was a weird kid <laughs> I was very um, humanistic I was very empathetic even as a little child and so when most of my friends had rock and roll posters in their rooms I had posters about helping other people <laughs> and you know I don't know supporting people and that kind of stuff and and so I started thinking about that who was I then what what made up Claudia what was Claudia and am I still that and yeah that's who I am I am empathetic I am compassionate I am a people helper I'm you know all those things I can put those on paper and I can embrace that because that I can be and and that was it and didn't you know I didn't think about about much else because um, there that was a great fear I, I thought my marriage would end I have no idea why that was just a thought like I'm gonna get better but my marriage is gonna end why why did I think that I have no idea it's just this really strange resistance that surfaces um, and it's protective it's the it's the mind trying to protect you and um, so I just had to have those conversations with people and say, I'm having this fear. You know, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and fortunately, you don't have to think about it until later because the universe somehow shows you what you're supposed to do when it's over and you're recovered. And, and it's such an important point because so many of us, and I've heard it sounded like a bit of this in your story and a lot of people I talk to, we come into illness out of very stressful circumstances. So I know for myself, I had to ask those questions as well. And it's such a hard question to ask because I loathed every single aspect of ME-CFS. Like I just, it was a nightmare. But so to sit and ask myself, how is this benefiting me? But when I was really honest mm -hmm. with myself, it was in some ways, you know, I, it was protecting me from having to go back to a life that I was living that I didn't want to be living anymore. I had, there were dialed down expectations. I'd been really driving myself hard. Uh, this gave me permission to finally take a break from that. And it was only a very small piece of my brain that thought these things, but how much power did that part of my brain have? What kind of protective mechanisms yeah. was it putting on me? So yeah, yeah, I think that's a really important, a really important thing to bring up. I think so too. And I've seen it with other people as well. So I think it's something to really give a little bit of thought to. Yeah, I had to do a lot of, it sounds like similar to you, just really envisioning what my life could look like. Like not going yeah. back, but going forward. Right. What pieces do I want to bring forward? And then what can I change? Like how can I have, how can I come out of this? How can I have a light at the end of the tunnel that is something that I'm actually striving for? Because <laughs> that's important. Yeah, because I think, I think the natural inclination at that point is to try to become what you were, right? because we don't know what else there is we can't it's hard to close your eyes and envision yourself as recovered from this because you don't know what that looks like and so you automatically try to replace yourself with who you were but who you were is 
part of why you got sick, right? The driven, stress mongering person, right? You can't, I could not be that person again. That was not going to help me stay well. So, yeah, I think it's taking the parts that you feel like you can still, the core parts of you that are still there, uh, that you still embrace. And then somehow, I don't know, I think Dan kept telling me, just live your life for the first year. Uh, and so I just played a lot and just kind of allowed myself to be for the first year. Um, and then COVID hit and I, I was playing pickleball. I, I started playing pickleball with a bunch of women and I got on a league and one day I was at pickleball practice and this woman said, yeah, I, I volunteer at the local hospital as a hypnotherapist. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. How fun. And I just sort of tucked it away. And then my thought at the time was, well, I have the psychology degree. I've, I've counseled people through audiology before. I should be a coach. I should coach people to wellness who are sick with these illnesses. That should be what I do. And um, the woman who was the hypnotherapist had attended, uh, it's called the Southwest Institute for Healing Arts here in Phoenix. And she said, yeah, um, they have classes for coaching. You ought to go look at it. So I did. And I was just about to sign up and start classes when COVID hit. And they were not going to teach that class, that course in person anymore. And um, they said, yeah, but we're offering the hypnotherapy class um, online. And so I thought, well, I don't know, I'll just take that and use that when I'm life coaching. You know, it's another tool, why not? And I took it and I fell in love with it. It's so powerful. So that's where I ended up. That's where I landed. Never expected that to happen. So So this is yeah. now, you are doing this for a living? This is now your career? Yeah, saying it's for a living is, is a lot. <laughs> 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 um, it, it is, I mean, you know, I'm... I'm 61 and my husband's sort of starting to scale back at work. So our next step would be retirement, right? So I don't want to work a lot, but yeah, I'm, I'm have my own hypnotherapy business and I'm doing that very part time. And some of my clients now are patients who are trying to recover and, um, and it's a beautiful thing. So yeah, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm seeing the power in it. I, I've treated people for a lot of various things and it's very rapid, kind of like my recovery. It's surprisingly quick. Uh, you know, there are people who go through psychotherapy for years and don't see improvement, but with hypnotherapy, you can have one to three sessions and get over a phobia you've had for your entire life. It's miraculous and it lasts. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I love it. I'm, it's wonderful. Connie, it's great to see because it seems like you've had a passion for these types of things, for helping people with your advocacy advocacy work, and it was very sounds like very challenging for you to step back from that. So it's nice that you've been able to come back in a new way. Uh, it's meaningful. It is. And... It, it is, and to come back to the community, right, and help other patients is is so important to me. I I feel like those of us who do find our way to recovery, we really need to share that experience and help others with all the tools that we found helpful and learn from others like you too and, and I see so much of it in our community some really amazing beautiful people that are really much in the thick of it and they're trying so hard to help everybody else and respond yeah. to lots of messages and you know raise money for research and all of this stuff and it's just and you, I, I talk to them and they have so much guilt about I don't know if I can keep doing this like you have lots of time yeah. you can come back right. to this I didn't even yeah. start any of this until I was fully recovered. I didn't have an ounce to give to anyone else. Like, it, it, it's like everyone around you is drowning, and you're also drowning, and you're trying to save them. And it's just, yeah. it's really not effective. It's really not helpful for, yeah. for anybody. <laughs> That's what advocacy felt like to me. I felt like, gosh, I, I can't. I'm reading these journal articles, and I can't even read a menu. <laughs> you know, like, come on, I can't do this. I can't write. I can't sit in a meeting. It was just so exhausting. But you know, no one else is doing it for the community, so it had to be the patients who were doing it. It's a lot. So what would you say to people who are currently facing this, especially people who have been facing chronic illness for a really long time? Or what would you say to yourself if you could go back in time? One of the things I, I say now to my clients is, 
if if someone you loved, if your child was as sick as you are and as sick as you have been and endured all that you have, how would you treat them? And what would you do for them? And what would you tell them? And typically, that really gets people thinking differently. And it, it worked for me. Someone said that to me. It invokes a nurturing mentality because I think our tendency is to push ourselves more than we should. Um, and because there is no medical acknowledgement of the severity of this illness, we don't get nurtured from the medical community and we don't get nurtured from society because of that. So it has to come from ourselves. So that's the first thing I say to people is really, you've got to love yourself. You've got to start nurturing yourself and act as though you're chronically ill. Give yourself permission to be chronically ill and understand that it's temporary. If, if you're in a recovery program, it's okay to say, yep, I'm here right now, I'm flat out, but it's not forever, it's temporary. Yeah, really, uh, that definitely all resonates. It's really powerful stuff, really simple things, you know, that nurturing aspect. I include it sometimes as part of my journaling practice, just, you know, yeah. what would I tell myself if I was my friend today? And just yeah. taking that moment to reflect on that and seeing yourself and your life and the way you're treating yourself and your behaviors through those eyes, it's, it's, it's amazingly powerful and can shift, can shift things. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I had a client the other day who's recovered, almost recovered, and she was telling me all the things she's experienced, and she stopped, and she said, oh my gosh, I've been through a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yeah, you have, you know, you have. But it's just hard to see it when you're sitting in the mud. Oh, Claudia, I am so grateful to you for taking the time to do this today. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Gosh, this has been a pleasure, oh, really. I just love it. I learned so much from every person I talk to, you included. It's such a gift, oh. and I really appreciate your time. If people want to learn more Thank about the work that you do or the coaching that you do or, or follow you on social media, is there a way that they can do that? I have a link for my hypnotherapy. It's called Divine Hypnotherapy. Um, I have a link to my art, Fine Art by Claudia Goodell. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> kind of everywhere <laughs> they can just google my name and all kinds of things will come up perfect and yeah of course i'll make sure all of those are in the video description so people watching be sure to expand the description take a look at those links and check out some of the great stuff that claudia is doing because it's really just incredible so yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, as always, to everyone who is watching. I know that people who watch my channel are often facing some incredibly difficult things that sometimes can feel like they're never going to end, but things can and do change. And uh, you've got this. You can totally do this. Good for you for watching videos like this and for watching to the end. That is incredible. <laughs> I know that's not easy. <laughs> especially with brain fog and all the things that we face. So yeah, I just always I just want to reach out to the people of the world and say, you know, hang in there. I know it's tough, but you're not alone. Many of us have been there. Uh, many of us get past it, and I believe that you can too. And I love the conversations that we have after the video, so looking forward to your thoughts and your comments in the video comments. And I'm sure Claudia and I will both be happy to respond to you there as well. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, and if you enjoyed this video, I have so many more full recovery stories on this channel. I'll put a link here up on the screen. It's just really inspiring and really insightful to hear from people like Claudia. So thank you again, Claudia. Thank you, thank you. everyone who's watching. Uh, that's it for today. And I will see you in the next video.